my brother's friend. I race across the kitchen, jump up on the counter, on the edge, scrape my arms, tear my dress, hold my heart that beats too loud, strain my eyes as I watch my brother's best friend driving up. His baseball caps pulled low. His eyes are hooded dark. His brown arm rests just perfect on the door of his car. I race across the room, jump over chairs and dogs. I hit my elbow, stub my toe, then slide onto the porch. There he is, my brother's friend, leaning on his car. I smile at him, call his name, wave my hand invite him in. But all he says without a glance is, hey kid, where's your brother? If there was anything that distracted me from writing poems and stories every day, it was my brother's best friend, Angel Rodriguez. Angel had been part of our family sitting around our Sunday table for lunch ever since Guadio started working at Rocco's Cafe with him two years before. One day, I looked at Angel across the table and saw more than Guadio's best friend. Suddenly, I couldn't help. I couldn't stop thinking about him. My mind, once a pool of words and ideas, was now filled up with images of Angel. My dark eyes trailed him like a line of hot soot wherever he went. That means she's following him. I knew I was in love with Angel because just thinking about him made me feel sick. It was the sickness of wanting something I could never have. Like the books, thick and lovely with words that I could never hold. Bookstore owners looked at me in my faded school uniform and closed their lips tight as they shook their heads. I might smudge the pages, they said. So I stood, my hands behind my back so I wouldn't be tempted, staring at books I could not open. That's how it was with Angel. I stared at his smiling face, his smooth brown muscles, and kept my thoughts behind my back. Angel and Guadio were best friends, but they were opposite stars in a galaxy. That means they're different. Whenever Angel came to our home, he laughed out loud and grabbed mommy's hand and danced her around the room. Hola, mi amor, he flirted. He slapped Poppy on the shoulder and took a swig of his rum straight from the bottle. He leaned close to Angela and whispered things in her ear that made her clap her hands over her mouth. You are malo, Angel, my sister giggled behind her hand. As for me, Angel winked at me carelessly and brushed my hair off my face, sometimes leaning down to kiss my cheek. I trembled fiercely as a hurricane gale was swooshing through my heart. So she's trembling. That means she feels nervous around him. My little Estrella, Angel called me. The rest of the day, we would all smile at each other more and say things we never would say during the rest of the week. Once I heard mommy tell Poppy, that boy has the perfect name. He sure brings heaven with him. Some weeks, I just could not wait for Sunday to come. So I left my Greek retreat after school, shouting to the wide open windows, Mommy, I'm going for a walk. 
I strolled down to Rocco's Cafe on the beach and sat on a hard stone wall watching Guadio and Angel dance their waiters around the beautiful tourists. I watched as girls whispered their orders, making Angel lean closely over to them, his ears touching their hibiscus red lips. Long smiles and fast winks went back and forth like a volleyball game. I did not mind watching all this because I never dared to dream of having Angel. Until the night of Rocco's big Christmas fiesta. Every year on, who? let's see, Noche Buena, the night before Christmas, Rocco has a big fiesta on the patio of his restaurant and everyone is invited. Even the families of the waiters. Rocco cooks a lechon asado over hot coals right on the beach. As they say, it is the best tasting roast pig ever. The children get first chunks of chicharrones, crispy pork skin, and it's the best Christmas present of all. The singing starts when the midnight stars are bright. Then the chairs are pushed back and the dancing goes on until Christmas Day comes. Bright and cheery over the green hills. Since Poppy had taught me to dance, I decided that this would be the fiesta, the best fiesta of all. I would finally stop sitting at the side and I would dance for everyone to see. I would show Angel that I was not just Guadio's little sister. I was Ana Rosa, a girl who could dance and dream. Okay, so she's saying at this big party, she's going to show Angel that she knows how to dance and she's not just some little girl, okay? Mommy said that she would stay at home. I have a whole pork leg to get ready and cook. But we all knew Poppy. As soon as that pork leg was finished, he would grab Mommy's arm and swing her down to Rocco's to dance a couple of merengues under the Christmas moon. Provided that he had not drunk more than one bottle of rum and fallen asleep under the porch light instead. Angela was going and she began preparing herself a whole week before. She even borrowed a page from my notebook to write down all the things she had to do just to get ready or to prepare. Every day she checked off something else. My nails are done, my legs are shaved, my dress is hemmed, and on and on. I had never seen Angela so concerned about anything before. And I began to wonder about her plans, but not too much because I was busy trying to get myself into the best looking me there ever was. Angel just had to see me as more than Guadio's little sister. And that was that. Okay, so Angela is taking this party very seriously. She wants to make sure she looks good that she's dressed nicely. She feels like she has to have a very good appearance. And Ana Rosa is noticing this and she's saying, hmm, should I get dressed? Like make myself look really good too? Finally, the day of the fiesta arrived. Mommy had made me a beautiful dress from two of Angela's old dresses. My dress had a long, dark green skirt that when I twirled around, it flowed out like ripples in a river pool. The top was white and lacy, like the delicate spider webs in the branches of my gri-gri tree. 
Mommy crawled my long brown hair into two into ringlets down my back. When I walked, they swung to and fro like a clock ticking of the minutes. I did not have fancy dress shoes, only thick brown shoes I wore to school and church or the rubber slippers I wore everywhere else. Mommy tried to stuff tissues into the toes of Angela's old dress-up shoes for me, but it did not work. As soon as I took a step, the shoes were left behind on the floor. Finally, I decided that I would wear my slippers, and when I got to the party, I would take them off and go barefoot with no shoes. That's what the tourist girls do, I told Mommy. They never wear shoes at all. With a worried look on her face, Mommy asked Guadio if it was true. He told her it was, and she said, okay. Guadio whistled when he saw me and spun me around. Carino, you will break my heart tonight, he said. Guadio looked as if he would break a few hearts himself. He had on his black waiter's pants. But instead of the white t-shirts they usually wore, he had on his long-sleeved white shirt with a red tie. His thick, dark hair was brushed back, and he looked dashing and handsome. All you need is a black mask, and I could call you Zorro, I joked. That was not when Angela appeared. There were no words that night for how beautiful my sister looked. Angela's hair was piled on top of her head with curls falling down like slow honey down to her shoulders. She made her dress herself from a piece of precious cloth mommy had brought out of an old suitcase stashed away there for her eldest daughter since Angela's birth. The dress was a column of ivory laced with threads of gold, and when Angela walked, she shimmered like the Christmas angel on top of the tree in Rocco's cafe. There were no flowing ripples in Angela's skirt, there was just Angela and her slim, perfect dress, and I had never seen anyone so lovely. Even Guadio was astonished when he took her hand. Poppy kept wiping his eyes as if he were seeing a mirage. You look just like your mommy when I first met her, he said. Mommy scoffed. Ha! I was wearing my wash day clothes, Poppy, she said. And you look just like this to me, he replied. Mommy and Poppy stood on the porch, their arms around each other. Roberto decided to wait and come later with them. So Guadio escorted me and Angela to the party. We could see the colorful Christmas lights blinking on and off at Rocco's Cafe. Long before we arrived, the night air was warm and laced with the scents of salt, flowers, and excitement. I saw Angel as soon as we walked in. My heart was tracking double time to the merengue beat, filtering through the conversation and laughter. Oh my, I whispered to myself. Angel was wearing the exact same clothes as Guadio, but on him, the white shirt looked like angel wings, and his smile was pure heaven. Mommy was right after all. I kicked off my slippers, 
under the edge of a huge tub of flowers and stood silently, waiting for Angel to see me, to see my grown up green mermaid dress, to lean his ear close to my curls so I could whisper, Feliz Navidad. But Angel never once looked at me except to smile quickly and say, Hola, little Estrella. The same as always, the same as on Sundays when I was dressed in shorts and t-shirts with dirty knees and two long braids. Angel's dark eyes and his long black eyelashes rested themselves like butterflies on my sister. And that was it. They stayed there the rest of the night. Angel and Angela, two beautiful angels, had become one. I walked away in my bare feet, my green river dress trailing behind me, my curls swinging back and forth to a soul sad rhythm. So Anna Rosa is feeling pretty badly right now because she wanted Angel to notice her. Hey, Cinderella, do you want to dance? Guadio stood before me, his hand outstretched. No, I shook my head and my curls and everything that was in me said it too. No, thanks. I walked around looking at all of the food spread out on bright red tablecloths. A nice smiling woman handed me a bowl of arroz con dolce, dulce, dulce, <laughs> and I tried hard to smile back. I put the tip of the spoon into my mouth and tasted the sweet rice pudding, but even this treat stuck like cement in my mouth. I saw the huge pig roasting on a spit next to the patio. The lights were so bright I could not see any stars. I walked over to the stone wall and sat down, swinging my bare legs. I watched Angel dancing with Angela under the Christmas lights. He was so tall and strong as he held my sister close and whispered in her ear. I saw her look up at him with eyes that if they were mine would be filled with moonlight and songs. This was not like looking at books I couldn't touch. This was a whole lot worse. No books or words, no poems or stories. Nothing could ever make me feel like this. It was as if I had swallowed a huge mouthful of seawater and I couldn't breathe. Oh God, I whispered. I must have dreamed wrong if I feel like this. I was still sitting on the wall when Guadio walked up next to me and handed me a glass of ice cold Coke. Then he leaned his elbow against the wall. Together we looked at the scene on the patio of Rocco's cafe. Everyone loves him. Don't feel bad, said Guadio. I don't, I replied, swallowing the cold drink. I didn't feel like asking Guadio how he knew. So Guadio knows that Anna Rosa likes Angel. And he knows that Anna Rosa feels sad and bad that Angel is talking to and dancing with Angela. Why do you sit here watching him if it hurts so much, he whispered. I sat very still, feeling Guadio's words touch me like cold rain. How do you know it hurts me? I asked. Guadio looked at me. I don't need words to know everything. Can anyone else tell? I asked fearfully. Angel can't, he said, and that's what you really want to know, right? I nodded. So it hurts and you sit here watching him anyway, asked Guadio. Yes, I nodded. I can't help it. 
Guardio shook his head and gave a little laugh. That's what they all say. I thought you would explain it better. Okay, so Guardio knows that she likes him. She's upset and he's asking, why are you sitting here watching it if it hurts you? And she's like, I don't know. And because she's good with words, he said, I thought you would be able to explain it. Um, I shrugged my shoulders and the sleeves of my river dress slid down. I yanked them back up. Haven't you ever been in love with anyone? I asked. No time for that, he answered quickly. His words slipped down my spine like ice. Yes, you have, I argued. Guario didn't say anything. He just turned his head and looked at the sea. I don't need words to know everything either, I said softly, putting my hand on top of his. Guario and I stayed by the wall. Me looking at Angel, spreading his cheer all over Rocco's cafe, and Guadio looking at the sea. Somewhere I knew there was a girl that my big brother loved, and although he would never admit it, I knew that I was the reason he was not somewhere far away. Maybe Canada, or Germany, or Nueva York, with his girl living his future. Maybe you have dreamed wrong too, I said. Staying here with us, I mean. Never, he answered and squeezed my hand. I have you, remember? And those were the words that put my broken heart in place just for a moment, just long enough for me to smile at my big brother. In his eyes, I saw the reflection of the Christmas lights. And I had to wonder, if not for the bright lights, would I see something else there? Something Guadio wanted no one to see? It was I who suggested we go back to the party, but I couldn't sing or dance that evening. So I sat next to the tub of red flowers and I waited patiently for Christmas Day to arrive over the green hills. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Angel and Angela. To stop thinking about them and to keep my belly from hurting so much, I thought about my brother Guadio instead and his search for his future. What I didn't know was that my own future was galloping toward me like a riderless horse. And with it were a lot of questions that only I could answer. That is the end of chapter five. And I hope you enjoyed listening.